Okay, good morning. I'm going to have you begin by introducing yourself. Good morning. Uh, my name is Amissa Miller, and my pronouns are she, her, and I am a professor in the Performing Arts Department at St. Mary's College of California. And talk about the approach that you use in your performing arts um, curriculum when you're working with students and how it's informed by um, diversity, equity, inclusion type issues. Sure. So um, quite a lot of the work that I do lives in the realm of what we might call interactive theater or applied theater. Um, there are lots of different names that folks use uh, for this kind of work, but um, at the core of it um, is the inspiration of a Brazilian artist and activist and theorist named Augusto Boal, who, um, sorry, my brain just went. <laughs> uh, Augusto Boal, who um, pioneered a, a method of art making called theater of the oppressed. Um, his standpoint is that all of us are artists and all of us are actors and that theater is actually a tool to, um, as he said, rehearse the revolution. So his idea is that if we are making theater together that is specifically about the issues and problems that we face within community, we can try out different solutions within that realm of the aesthetic space, uh, strengthening our muscles so that when we actually go out into the world, we have in our bodies the practice of trying on those different interventions of interrupting harm when it happens of proposing different solutions of practicing solidarity and allyship um, and so a lot of the work that i do is is really rooted in that is really rooted in um, the belief that theater is not just an experience where we sort of sit back and passively take in a story that theater is actually something that we are actively participating in as we are building the world that we want to live in so that philosophy um, undergirds a lot of the work that I do as an artist and as an educator. That's amazing. And this idea of facing the revolution and kind of strengthening the muscles so we have an opportunity to kind of challenge things that happen in front of us. Uh, this is quite a moment in time <laughs> to be having, you know, like the, the world as your stage right now, right? If we look at the world as our stage and we look at all the different incidents of racial injustice that are happening, um, particularly you and I were talking about just the other day how um, even within the different social justice movements, there's a gendered component there. And sometimes some of the women whose lives have been lost to police violence, I've heard we're not talking about them as much. Um, so I'm just gonna let you kind of comment. I've given you a, a kind of a bouquet, <laughs> an abstract bouquet of issues in that statement, but kind of what is coming up for you as I'm talking about this? Well, there's a lot that comes up for me um, as a Black woman who loves Black people and believes in the power um, in our communities and believes in our liberation and believes in our right to be free and to live in peace and joy uh, and health. And I believe that for all of us. I don't only believe that for those of us who um, are deemed respectable <laughs> victims. I don't only believe that for those of us who, um, for whatever reason, get more um, media attention or public support than others when we are harmed or killed. Um, I believe that for all of us. And, and so it's particularly um, important to me that those of us who are not cis men are also seen as worthy of protecting and worthy of fighting for. Um, it, is, it is powerful that as many people um, as we saw last summer took to the streets um, because of the, I think, particular nature of the brutality of George Floyd's murder and the fact that it was documented in a way um, that it was impossible to ignore for a lot of folks who I think can often choose to ignore these sorts of incidences of violence. But it's also disheartening that we have not seen that same mass mobilization on behalf of Black girls, Black women, Black gender nonconforming people. Um, I'm thinking in particular, of course, of Micaiah Bryant. As we all were waiting and watching to see what the verdict would be in the Derek Chauvin trial, 16-year-old Micaiah Bryant called the police for help, felt unsafe, felt threatened, 
was trying to defend herself and ended up losing her life, ended up having her life taken from her. And rather than seeing people rallying to support, I've seen a lot of folks justifying her murder, looking for reasons to blame her for her death rather than blaming the officer who shot her, rather than blaming the system of policing itself, rather than blaming the society that criminalizes Black youth. And so I think it's really important that if we are ever to achieve the liberation that we say that we want as Black communities, we have to recognize that that means all of us. <laughs> and too often we see that Black women and girls are right there at the forefront of our liberation movements, doing the organizing work, leading the protests, doing the mutual aid work, you know, speaking the names of, of um, Black people of all genders. So often Black women and girls are right there. And far too often we see that when we are the ones who've been killed, when we are the ones who've been harmed, whether that's harm that's coming externally from outside of our community or harm that is happening within our community, we don't see that same mobilization to show up for us. And I believe that that is the next frontier in our Black liberation movement. If we can get to a place intracommunally where we slay the dragons of misogynoir, we slay the dragons of cis heteropatriarchy. If we can slay those dragons, to me, I was, I was speaking with a friend earlier this week um, and we sort of framed it as, you know, those are like the final bosses that we have to defeat within black community. And if we can do that, you know, this is what Barbara Smith and the folks in the Combahee River Collective were saying that when we do that, when we make sure that Black women and girls and gender non-conforming folks are safe and well, it necessarily means that all of us are. So that's what's coming up for me when you pose that question. That's a lot. And we're going to delve into some of that. I mean, a couple of things are coming up. Like even to this day, I can remember Micaiah's first name and then I it's like flipping her last name, right? And her story, we heard about it the day that the day after we, we found out it happened right around the time that the the verdict came out and then we heard it in the news the next day. It's not really in the news very much anymore. Um, I'm also thinking of, there was another trans woman in um, Berkeley, Kayla Moore, who died when she was put into a restraint. Um, there's so many, right? We can't even come up with all their names and some, we might not even know all their names. They might have not gotten the same amount of press coverage. But I wonder if we should talk a little bit about Micaiah and what, the, what we've been able to piece together about her just so we can keep pieces of her legacy alive a little bit. Um, I heard an interview with her mother and I, I understand that she was working toward getting back home to live with her mother. She was doing well in school. Um, and I'm trying to think, what, what else have you heard about Micaiah's story, um, her backstory that you can add to that? You know, the thing that I'd really like to name right now, the thing that's coming up for me is, um, I've actually seen quite a few of Micaiah's TikTok videos. Uh, and I don't know if you've seen them, but they've been making the rounds on uh, my social media feeds. And one of the things that I've appreciated is just getting to see her as a little girl, <laughs> just getting to see her as a 16 year old making TikToks where she's doing different hairstyles and, you know, smiling and preening for the camera and, you know, brushing down her baby hairs um, while listening to music um, and her, her softness, her joy, um, her, her being a child. <laughs> I've really appreciated that because far too often, especially when we lose our young people, we tend to forget that they're not martyrs. They're not poster children. They're actually just our babies. <laughs> they're our young people. And so it's been really lovely for me to just see her expressing herself in a medium that lots of young people are using these days to express themselves. 
and to just see her being happy and living her life. I've needed that. There were quite a few, um, I believe the organization is Black Feminist Futures. There were quite a few sort of pockets of Black feminist folks across the country a couple of weekends ago who um, held vigils for Micaiah. And one of the things that they did is they, they simply collected the artifacts that remind us all of our Black girlhood. <laughs> so they collected barrettes and bubbles for the hair. Um, they collected, you know, articles of clothing, um, things that felt soft and felt like girlhood to them and felt joyful and reminded them of Micaiah's girlhood, her black girlhood, and, and offered those things um, at altars uh, across the country for Micaiah. So that's what I'd like to remember about her. I, as much as it is important for us to remember how she died, it's really important for me to remember how she lived. And, and so I, I feel fortunate that I got to see a little piece of that in the TikTok videos that I, that I saw on, on my Twitter timeline. Um, just being able to see her smile and be a child was really important to me. Yes, I, I appreciate that example so much. And I'm thinking about as a mother, um, just how I felt hearing from her own mother and then hearing you talk about those things. Um, and I'm feeling joy and deep sadness because I'm thinking like, oh, I can go watch some TikToks by this girl, but actually I can only watch TikToks that were already made because there won't be any more. And so that kind of finality that like this, this period, the punctuation mark being put at the end of her life right here at the young age of 16 is, is the real tragedy here. Um, so I'm just, that's coming up for me as you're talking about that. And it, it underscores the importance of exactly everything that you've said. Um, absolutely, absolutely. And I wish that we could hold that for for all of the folks that we've lost, right? Not, not just our young people, um, for every life that's been taken from our communities, right? All of us are people who love and are loved, <laughs> who have joy, who have connection and relationship and family and dreams and things that we wanna be and do. And those things get snuffed out, they get, they get stolen from us. Um, and so it's, 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 as you said, it's holding the joy of knowing that 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 we can know her on some level in that way. And it's holding the deep sadness and grief and rage in recognizing that that light was snuffed out. Yeah, that's well put. And along with talking about kind of like, like holding up some of her light and some of the things that are joyful uh, as we remember the way she lived her life. I think we should also spend a little bit of time, even though it's less fun to talk about, but um, the way in which she's been criminalized and blamed for her death. We see this, we saw it with George Floyd. We see it with everybody, right? And I'll see it even in social media, like, oh, if so-and-so hadn't been in that place, if they hadn't been running around regarding the 13 year old in Chicago, if they hadn't been running around with mm -hmm. a gun, instead of saying, well, what, what was happening in the society that had this young child running around with a gun? What would it have looked like if an intervention happened and they got him some support? Or mm -hmm. I heard that he was like a very artistic child. What would have happened if he was able to explore that? Um, instead of looking again at like the system, um, we're going to that. And so we know, I've heard a number of people say, well, there's no choice. This woman had a gun, this 16 year old had a knife and she was going to kill somebody. Um, to me, that doesn't make sense. It, these are trained officers. I think that they would have a background in de-escalation or in theory they would. Um, but what comes up to you when, um, when she's portrayed in the media as somebody who was going to be a cold blooded killer who was going to stab somebody and they had no choice? Right. Um... There's a lot that comes up for me around that. Um, I think there are two lines of thinking that emerge. It is not surprising that folks outside of Black community are primed to criminalize Black folks. 
that is deeply ingrained in the history of our country. So that is actually not surprising to me. Is it upsetting? Yes. Is it something that needs to be eradicated? And is that the work of white folks to do within community? Yes. I think the thing that has been more upsetting to me has, has been seeing that happen within black community. Seeing folks within black community look at Micaiah in particular and say, well, she shouldn't have had a knife. To me, I understand that as, and this might sound strange, but this is also a coping mechanism that emerges among black folks, right? Because on some level, we want to believe that if we make the right choices or our loved ones make the right choices, then we will not end up becoming hashtags. And so some part of us subconsciously is looking at her and saying, what are the things that she did wrong? What are the things that her family did wrong? And if I can avoid doing those things, and if I can tell my children to avoid doing those things, then maybe we will be safe. The sad realization is that nothing we do or don't do will protect us. Our very bodies are criminalized simply by existing, simply by breathing. And that's a hard realization to hold. I think the human brain wants to rationalize because we want to know how to keep ourselves safe. And so that's, that's one deeply subconscious working that I believe is happening with, with lots of black folks as they look at cases like this. They're, they're trying to separate themselves from it. They're trying to say, if I am not like her, then maybe this won't happen to me. But of course we know that that's not true. <laughs> Of course, we know that Ayana was asleep in her bed and she was seven years old. Brianna was asleep in her bed. Atatiana was playing video games with her nephew. None of these are criminal acts. There are no weapons involved. And yet all three of those people are dead. And so I, I, I do believe on some level, as black folks, we have to recognize that no amount of respectability is going to save us. No amount of trying to separate ourselves from, from others in our community is going to save us. No amount of achieving our way <laughs> out of whatever conditions we feel um, might be you know, confining us within our communities, no amount of that is going to save us. We have to be the ones to say that we are ready to, to fight for our liberation. And that has to mean that we, we have to believe that every black life is precious, regardless of what choices an individual makes or does not make in the face of state violence. So that comes up for me. Yeah, and what I'm thinking about is recently, we looked at the is blaming the victim culture as a whole, and we looked at how does racial profiling or in these examples that you're giving, the rationalization of death that has been un unnecessary death killings, actually we're talking about here. Um, what does that have to do and how is it related to rape culture, right? And and what you're talking about make, is, makes it so crystal clear in some ways, right? If I just don't do X, Y, or Z, if it's just what's wrong with that person, then it can't be me, right? Um, you're absolutely right, Sharon. It is the same mentality um, because these systems are not disconnected from one another, right? Um, and, you know, I am someone who uh, has done a lot of work around uh, sexual violence prevention, utilizing interactive theater to engage uh, young people in conversations around violence prevention, around consent, around healthy relationships. Um, and as a part of that work, I've come to understand, uh, you know, Bowal has this um, practice called the cop in the head. And he uses that to identify those internalized voices that we carry when we are faced with some form of oppression or violence that stop us from believing ourselves, that stop us from taking action, that keep us thinking that somehow it's our fault, that somehow if we had done something differently then we would not have been harmed in the way that we were harmed. And so I think you're right. I think there's 
a, a pretty direct correlation between what we're describing about the victim blaming culture that folks who've experienced sexual violence know intimately well, unfortunately, and the victim blaming culture that emerges in cases like Micaiah's. Um, and in both of those, of course, ultimately we know that the fault does not lie with the person who was harmed. Of course. And this is speculative and above and beyond what we even thought about talking about, but using informed theater as your lens or your like your from your scholarly lens in a way that we could have approached the way that people should have approached Micaiah's calling the police different. What would be an alternative for those people who can't imagine how this could have gone any other way? What would you, mm. this is very speculative. So um, mm. let me know what you think. Well, it's interesting that you use the word speculative because, you know, in a lot of ways, I think this fight for liberation is speculative work. We are attempting to envision and then hopefully enact a world that we have never known. We've never known this world without anti-Blackness, without misogynoir. We've never known this world without policing, without prisons. Um, and so it is speculative work. <laughs> it really is saying, you know, can we use a radical imagination to envision a different world and a different way of being? And then can we take the steps toward creating that? So I think it's actually really appropriate to, to think of it in speculative terms. One of the things that I've been reflecting on is just how many folks I know, educators, <laughs> mentors, people that we might call, you know, elders or OGs in a community who would have known exactly how to, 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 to de-escalate and disarm in that situation because they've done it before. This is not new. <laughs> Folks within our communities every day are doing this work of, of, of supporting our young people, of mentoring our young people, of intervening in conflict between our young people, of mediating conflicts between young people, of, of finding ways to, to, to generate processes where young people can, can air grievances or differences and come to some sort of resolution where folks who've been harmed can, can find justice. This is already happening every day. The, the disconnect is that that police officer didn't look at Micaiah and think, how do I deescalate in a way that actually preserves life? that police officer was not someone who, as, I, as the folks I named, educators, mentors, elders, who, folks who, who actually value and want to preserve black life. So if that's not there, if the underlying motivation is not to protect and preserve life, it's really hard to think that any kind of training is going to get us out of that, right? I don't know that any specific de-escalation training would have actually changed that particular officer's unconscious processing that led him to take the action that he took. What needs to happen is that we need to actually value and want to preserve and protect Black life. And when we do that, we find ways because that's what we've always done. So I, I guess my, my response to that is, if we want to think about what could have happened differently in that situation, look to folks who are doing that work with young people in our communities. Look to folks who are, are doing violence interruption work. Look to folks who are doing restorative justice work. Look to folks who are every day loving and engaging with and supporting and protecting and preserving the lives of young Black people, of young Black girls and boys and gender nonconforming people, because they're already practicing that. And in this um, act of radical imagination, imagination and speculation that we're doing right yeah. now. Um, I'm imagining that in this ideal scenario that we're creating, right, co-creating in our imaginations right now, um, maybe there's a team of people and in that, in, in the police car is a, a mediator, an elder from the community. Um, it, it sounds like a remaking of what, a dismantling and remaking of what we know, right? Absolutely. And it's, um, it's a reframing in that we, I, I believe that we have to stop 
holding faith in the system of policing as being one that will keep us safe because we've seen far too many examples that it won't. And so I wish that in that scenario, Micaiah had had an elder in the community that she could have called, a mentor, a teacher, somebody that she knew and trusted that she could have called who would have been there and available and able to support all of the folks involved in that altercation, de-escalate that situation. The fact that she felt that calling the police was her only option is a part of the tragedy. Yes. So Wanda Johnson, Oscar Grant's mother, and I talk about this a lot, and she talks about how we cannot not look at the white supremacist nature of policing as we know it. And I guess that came to, like, it became very, if we already knew that that was a thing, then it was, all of a sudden it was in, like, neon um, as I was watching the testimony during, in the closing arguments during the George Floyd trial, and I was watching all of the things that are permissible, right? These are like net federal guideline books and then they were specific to Minneapolis Police Department, which are not very different than any other police department. And so the amount of things that were permissible, the amount of restraints that were, the amount of when it is okay to use force, um, how much force you can apply and for how long. And it can be just the perception that um, the person could be restrained and you could just believe that there was a risk that they might get up and move that that could that alone could give you enough justification to continue restraining so i the amount of things that are permissible first of all the amount of subjectivity that's there it it like i don't know it was baffling to just watch how many of the things like in that particular case all these other cases we don't know if they'll if you know they'll get the same kind of attention or if they'll be the same type of trial but it was so blatant in that. And for me, it just really underscored the re like the need to really re rethink all of it, right? And rethink um, all of the things that that operate. And I don't and I don't know how we're going to get there without talking about the white supremacist root of policing. Do you have thoughts? I imagine you do. Well, I think you're absolutely right that policing is a white supremacist institution. And if folks are not willing to say that, own that, and really actually start thinking about creating alternatives that are not rotten at the core, the way that policing is, then we're never actually going to get anywhere. If we keep thinking that it's about one individual officer whose force was excessive, one individual's officer whose subjectivity led him in a direction uh, that that took that took the, those um, those afforded actions a little bit too far. If we keep making it about individual reforms or trainings within the institution, we're going to keep coming up against situations like this. I, I, I have to be honest and say that I did not watch much of the Derek Chauvin trial. It was not something that I had the capacity to do. One of the things that I heard is that the prosecutor at one point said, the system of policing is not on trial here. We can all agree that policing is good. Policing is necessary. This is not about whether or not policing is bad or wrong. This is about this one individual officer. And I'm paraphrasing, of course, because I didn't watch it. Um, but that should, that should tell us all that we need to know about whether or not this individual case, this individual trial is actually a marker of any sort of progress. A lot of people want to believe that it is, and I understand deeply why people want to believe that it is. But for me, if we're still holding the argument that the system of policing is fine, it's just that there are a few individual people <laughs> who go too far, that the system of policing is fine, we just need a few more diversity and de-escalation trainings, 
if that's the conclusion that folks have drawn from this trial, we got rid of this one bad apple, so now we can just go back to the way things were before. That's not progress to me. Yeah, there's a lot there. And as I, I also didn't watch uh, the whole thing, but the, the closing arguments for so long. And I, I saw that as the prosecutor's strategy to get one particular officer held accountable. So some feel like this is having one person being held accountable is one one step of one tiny step of progress. Um, knowing that knowing that like it, it might be one tiny step of progress and that there's a little bit of accountability. I was talking about this with Wanda Johnson and she was like, gosh, you know, she's been fighting for so many years. And, and I was thinking like, maybe, maybe if we're looking for some silver lining, all these other cases have started to build a little bit of infrastructure for a system of accountability. And I hope that that can be one step toward the speculative imagination that we're having about what it might look like in the future. How optimistic are you? Well, I think there is a difference between punishment and accountability. So I think what we're describing here is that one officer is being punished, is facing consequences. But for me, accountability actually means that there has to be some kind of a relationship, right? I am accountable to you because I have a relationship with you. There's trust there. There's mutual investment there. And it's abundantly clear that police are not accountable to black people. <laughs> police are not accountable to black communities. And so I, I certainly don't wanna minimize the fact that for families of folks who've been murdered by the state, for many of them, it does matter that the folks who have murdered their loved ones face some sort of consequence, right? But I think it's important to make that distinction that just because an individual faces consequences for an action that they've taken doesn't necessarily mean that accountability is happening. I think that's an important distinction and thank you for that. I'm aware of our time and I know you have to go shortly, but before we go, I'd love to learn a little bit about your journey. What is it in your life that led you into this work? Sometimes when people think about theater, they think about something that, that you consume. Like you said, you sit back and enjoy and relax and watch it. And that's not what you're doing at all. Talk about your journey. What got you here? That becomes a harder and harder question to answer the older I get, I think, <laughs> because there, there is a part of me that um, is deeply aware that on some level, being born into this world, in the body that I'm in, in the family that I'm in, in the communities that I'm a part of, it almost feels like there is no other way, if that makes sense. You know, I, I have always known from the time I was a young person and my, my parents exposed me to black art that was never just art for the sake of art. It was always art that was meant to challenge the system, art that was meant to fortify a sense of identity and and connection and love among and between us, um, art that was meant to show us possibilities of what the world could be. I, I've never known art to be a thing that wasn't engaged with the people and for the people. That's what I've always known. Um, and so it's informed every choice that I've made. Uh, in the more quote unquote traditional theater that I've written and directed and dramaturged, as well as in the interactive and applied theater work that I've done. It's such a powerful tool, art, storytelling, theater, it's such a powerful tool. And for me, I've never not thought of it in that way. I've never not thought of it as
one of the tools in our arsenal, one of the things that we utilize in community as a part of our liberation movements. So it's not necessarily something that I can sort of pinpoint a trajectory and say, oh, I did this and then I did that and then I did that. It's always been there and the older I get, I have more opportunities to connect with more people who are creating in the same way and to allow that to continue to unfold. Yeah, it sounds like it's a way of being for you without there being an alternative. Yes. And this last question, it, it can be difficult and you can even opt out if you choose to, but um, I always love to ask this to people, even every time I interview them, but if you had to kind of think of the most important journey that you've learned thus far, doing the work, living the life that you've lived, what would that be for you? Wow. Um, Just that little question. <laughs> no big deal, right? <laughs> the most important thing that I've learned in doing the work that I do. Wow, okay. Um, I think the most important thing that I've learned in the, doing the work that I do is that and I believe it's Mariam Kaba, prison abolitionist who says this that anything worth doing is done with other people. That none of us are on this journey alone. None of us are solely responsible for this work. None of us are able to do it on our own. It necessarily requires relationships, requires community building, requires coalition building, requires collaboration, requires solidarity. And so if there's one thing that I've learned, it's that, that, that ultimately it's about whether or not we are doing our work in relationship with and accountability to other people. Because that's what, that's what, that's what our life and our living is about, right? It's, it's never just about our own individual journey. It's always about connection, community, relationship, preserving that, valuing that, honoring that, centering that, in any of the work that we are doing toward liberation. That's beautiful. Is there anything else you'd like to add? I don't think so. <laughs> I know we've covered a lot of territory, but yeah. I want to thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me today. Absolutely. Sharon, thanks so much for having me.